glad you're here this morning. Yeah. I'm glad you're here this morning. I'm glad I get to preach to you. Open your Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Most people use this for funerals. We're going to use it for a resurrection. Glory to God. I've been thinking about this. By the way, welcome to all of our visitors. If you're parents... If you are parents and you came today to be with your kids, I'm not going to embarrass you, but would you just stand up and sit back down from out of town? Just stand up, sit back down. We are glad you're all there. Yeah, it's good to see you. Y'all aren't visiting, y'all. Y'all just go away for a while and then come back. But it's good that y'all are here. Make yourself at home. Uh, we just love Jesus and we're not real formal. So uh, if something goes wrong, it didn't go wrong. It was meant to be that way. Are there any announcements that we need to make chapters for? Any announcements we need to make? Uh, who's that other guy? The policeman from Nicholasville. Joseph. Joseph, are there any announcements? Right. I've got an announcement I'm going to make, but I'll make it here in a second. I, I've been thinking about our uh, young mothers and young fathers in the church. And... Uh, the evolving families. And uh, I remember back when I was 35 to 40 years old. That was an extremely stressful time. Does anybody in here remember when you were 35? Mary Jo, can I get an amen, sister? Those are stressful times. You don't have a lot of money. We didn't have a lot of money. We were, as my dad used to say, too poor to pay attention. Too much month left at the end of the money. <laughs> we were poor. And we had kids. And we had a small house. And I, I got to think that some of y'all are starting to get there. We didn't have insurance. We got, we got, we, let's see, we got, we got two babies we paid cash for. One baby was free. And, and we had insurance for the other two. And they were getting older. In addition to the, the shortage of money, oh, by the way, shortage of money always creates interesting situations with vehicles. <laughs> now, see, some of you know what I'm talking about. And so, also during that time, what starts to happen is balancing life gets difficult. You got the money thing, you got the job thing. You got the church thing, you got the family thing, you got the everything. And you're trying to balance it all, and it just all begins to, to get heavy on you. How, how many of you all remember that time? How many of you all feel it coming on? Come on now. All you young fathers, put your hand up and say, man, help me now. You fit right in the middle of it. How many of you are right in the middle of it? It's like... There's not enough money and there's not enough time and how do I do all of this? And so next week, uh, and this is the announcement for the LCF people, and I'm sure Chad will follow suit and do the same thing before long, uh, and JCF people, we're going to get together and we're going to talk to people at that stage of life and, and give you some advice. But today I'm going to give you one piece of advice. But if you're single, don't feel left out. I also remember when I was single, I remember when I was about 20 years old. If there's ever a time that I honestly, and I'm being just as honest as I can be, thought about suicide, it was about 20, 21, 22 years old. And it was the doggone unanswered questions. Okay, well, that doesn't apply to anybody. Okay, so then, any of you single people have unanswered questions that drive you crazy? Raise your hand. Well, I knew you were crazy. I, was, I, I knew you were crazy. Come on now. How many of you all remember the time that you were single and you had all these questions? You know, what am I going to be when I grow up? How many of you the craziness never went away? <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. I mean, it, it is. It's like you're just a person walking around. You know, in America, you're not going to starve. You, you probably live in a neighborhood where you're not going to get killed. But somehow, all those questions in your mind drive you almost crazy. 
I don't know why, but Bill, you know, you counsel kids like this all the time. It's a fact. It's a reality. But you just can't see it. But then I'm getting to this other stage of life. I'm a lot more confident now. Stuff doesn't bother me, but, but the plate gets more and more full. Not only, not only if, if you're obedient to God, does, does, does more get put on your plate to do and be, but then you begin to think, well, in 10 years, I might start slowing down a little. Wait a minute. No, you start thinking, I started slowing down a little bit 10 years ago, and I realized it. I thought I was just kind of sick and it was going to get better. It never got better. I, you know, I'm going to recover and start getting my strength back. I said, you know, 20, pretty strong, you know, 25, you still think you can beat up anybody. 30, man, life is great. 35, 40, Joseph, it's coming. 50. And then by about 60, it's like you finally realize, unless these super miracle drugs that they talk about on the internet are real, you're not going to get any, any better. And the health care that you didn't have when you were 22, 23, 24 years old, and you knew you didn't need it, takes on a whole new perspective at this age, doesn't it, Joe? <laughs> you now know you would be an idiot not to have insurance. And then you think, when well, you're going to live. Then you get older. <coughs> Who's going to take care of you? So life is full of these questions. And we're going to have a seminar on each of those to help you with those. But we're going to give you the first step. The first step. Wherever you are, whoever you are, at whatever age, in whatever state you're in, I'm going to give you the first step today. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and where you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached to you, unless you have believed in vain. For I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again. Amen. On the third day, according to the Scripture, and He was seen. And it goes on and says He was seen of Cephas, He was seen of the Twelve, He was seen of above 500 people who were still walking around when Paul wrote this, and then James and the Apostles, and then finally... Paul himself saw Jesus born out of season. So there's two things. First of all, let me point out that it says in the ESV, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. In the ESV, you all don't know I'm a King James person, uh, but most of the churches in the ESV uh, group. Chad, did you get my note? Yeah. Chad sent out a note. Uh, you asked Chad about it. I, I corrected one of his notes for him. Uh, but there's two points here. First of all, Paul says, I'm going to write to you that which is of first importance. And he has to be that which is first of first importance. Now, here's what you've got to understand. He has just finished writing a letter to the craziest church that he oversaw, the Corinthians. They were former homosexuals. They were former uh, uh, adulterers. Whoremongers. They had one guy living with his dad's wife. Uh, they, uh, they were crazy. And at the end of it, Paul says, but let me tell you what is of first importance. Don't care who you are, where you are, what's going on, what the problem is. Let me tell you the thing that is of first importance. First of all, Christ died for your sins. And second of all, He rose again the third day. That's where you start, no matter who you are, no matter what age you are, you've got to realize that the way out of darkness is this. Christ died for your sins. Amen. Amen. And He didn't stay in the grave. He got up the next day. Amen. So first of all, let me just say this. I like saying this. You have sinned. You have sinned against 
the Almighty God and you deserve hell. I like saying that to people. I love saying that to people. I feel like I almost have a corner on the market. <laughs> Everybody else likes saying, what's your, what's your problem? Christ didn't die for your problems. Some people like saying, well, tell me about your background. Christ did not die for your background. Amen. Religious people like to hide behind the fact that they were born with a sinful nature. Christ died for your sins. I like to say that. Because people are wrapped up in this confusion. Well, how can I get help? You need to be forgiven for your sins. Yeah, but I've, I've got this problem. Yeah, your problem is sin. Yeah, I just can't. Yeah, I know you can't. That's called sin, and Christ died for sin. Jesus did not come to bring everybody to heaven and rearrange heaven according to their problem, the way they were raised, their nature. Christ came and paid a price to forgive your sins. Is anybody mad at me? Over 40 years I have been ministering to college students. And it's very interesting. They come to me with all kinds of problems. And it's interesting when the Word of God and the Spirit of God get together and begin to focus on an individual that has a problem, usually... It uncovers sin. I'm a much better counselor than I am a preacher. Amen. <laughs> I was waiting on that. Because I know the secret. People are proud and people are fearful and people don't want to admit that they have a need. They, they, they want to get better at what they are. We need to repent of what we are. Amen. Christ died for our sins. And over and over, I find that when it comes down to that focus, they want to they do everything to admit their sin. But here's the problem with not admitting sin. You can't forget, get forgiven unless you confess your sin. Unless you confess that I am a sinner in deep need of forgiveness, Christ died for your sins. And that's the way out, is to just confess to Him. Hey, He knows. It says that we have a high priest. He came and He was touched with every feeling of infirmity. He knows what it is to be tempted, yet He didn't sin. And because of that, He knows what's going on inside of you. And you need to get in touch with what's going on inside of you. I choose to do what is unloving to my husband. I choose to do what is unloving to my wife. I choose to take a little more than what's mine. And I don't deserve that. If, if, if I can make this clear and, and help you understand, societies fall apart because justice is not done. Societies fall apart because they become unjust. Rome fell apart because they became unjust. The Byzantine Empire dissipated because it became unjust. Europe, the history of Europe is the history of nations rising and nations falling because they become unjust. And that will be our history too. The United States of America, if we don't become just, there's only one kingdom where justice has never been denied. Where justice has never been overturned. And that is the kingdom of God. God is absolutely just. Now listen to me. Every single sin will receive its just punishment. And every righteous act will receive its just reward. Every sin will be punished. Now here's the deal. Jesus died for our sins. 
Jesus, the Bible says, became the propitiation for our sins. And because he was just, he could die in our place. But here's the deal. If you don't repent of your sin, you still have sin in your life. And the just reward of sin is separation from the kingdom. Because that kingdom is going to last forever. And there will be not be one unjust act in heaven. Bad news, huh? Except for this fact. God knows you. God loves you. And God made a way out. You've got to come to the place that you realize, just like you think Hitler ought to be in hell, just like you think Al Capone should have gone to jail, just like you think Heinrich Himmel should have been killed, you've got to realize you deserve hell apart from Jesus. And then you have to remember He loved you enough to die for you. You can't have both. You can't justify yourself. I've got this problem. I've got this genetic need. I've got this way I was raised. I've got this religion. If you want to justify yourself that way, good luck. There's a better way, though. And it's the only way. It is to say, here's justice. I deserve hell for my actions. But God, I see your goodness. I see your mercy. I see your love. And I just confess to you, I've been mean. I've been selfish. And I don't deserve heaven. I deserve hell. And at that point, you know what happens? Angels begin to rejoice. They start beating their drum. <laughs> they see it coming. They start the organ. I wish we had an organ. Oh, he's beginning to see. He's about to get sick. He's about to break. God's about to get through his self-justification. God's about to get through where he's justifying himself or herself because of the way other people act. They're about to be broken and to say, I need to be forgiven. I don't belong in heaven. I would ruin it. Did Christ die for you? He died for your sins. What are they? What are they? Confess your faults. And he's faithful and just for you. Amen? Amen. Well, get in touch with yourself. Here's the second part, though. And I don't, I don't know how to explain this. The second part says... He rose the third day. Here's the other part. We get forgiven. We are sure of heaven. But here's the thing, and I don't know how to explain it other than this. A person who has not sinned cannot be held by death. We are here to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is a scripture that will be read all over America today. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Again. I don't know why, and I can't explain it. But death cannot hold a person in the grave unless there's sin attached to them. That's what we see in Jesus. Yes, He died for your sins. And that makes God just in forgiving you of your sins. But He had not sinned. So death could not keep him in the grave. Hallelujah. Now let me ask you a question. Did Christ die for your sins? Yes, he did. The Bible says that, that, that God says 
If you confess your sins, I will forgive you your sins. And Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I, and he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember thy sins. Everybody knows Psalm 103. It says, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Now, let me ask you a question. Answer it out loud. Why couldn't death hold Jesus in the ground? What did Jesus do for you? What can death do to you? Nothing. The grave cannot hold you in the ground. It's those two facts that are the first principles that answers every problem. Number one, I am forgiven and I have a relationship with God. And because of that, death. Death can not keep me in the ground. I live in an absolutely just kingdom where there is no sin. Death has no power and no authority over me. So I no longer live to this world. I live to the resurrected Christ who has defeated every sickness, every disease, all poverty, and has established a kingdom that I live in right now. And so we come and we celebrate the resurrection of Christ because we are no longer bound to sin, but we're also no longer bound to this world and death and fear. And so it gets to the end of that chapter, and here's what it says. 1 Corinthians 15.50 I'm finished. Kent? Oh, there you are. I tell you this, brothers. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised and perishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the same that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that the Lord in the Lord that your labor is not in vain. Look up at the beginning of this chapter. I declare to you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached to you, unless you have believed in vain. I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received. What did Paul deliver to them? What he had received. What did he receive? Christ has died for your sin. And he rose from the dead. But look what he said before that. You have received this. How many of you received this fact? How many of you received the fact that Jesus Christ died for your sin? And you repent and you make more of your life. Paul's writing to people like us. People from the church just like that. But somewhere along the way, we realized we need to be forgiven. And we received the fact that Christ died from our sin, for our sins. And He's resurrected. But then it goes on. And it says, wherein you stand. Wherein you stand. We didn't just receive it a few years ago and get a ticket, but day by day we stand in this truth. My sins are forgiven, and I'm on my way to heaven. And then the third thing it says, it says, you will also be saved if you keep this in memory. Listen, our salvation, our deliverance from everything in this life, past, we were forgiven. Present, 
We are standing in this fact. And we look forward to the fact that as long as we live in this truth, as long as we live in this truth, and as long as we continue to live to the resurrected Christ, we will be ultimately deliver, delivered from this world, from sin, darkness, and everything that causes confusion, pain, and hurt. Jesus Christ is coming back. The trump's going to sound. And it says that our bodies, if we've already passed on, will come together again. Immortal. And those of us that remain, in the twinkling of an eye, it will be changed. I don't know if there's anybody here today that you've never got in touch with the cosmic reality. But here's the fact. No unrepentant sin will be in heaven. You can't hang on to your sin as a weight and get to heaven. You can't justify it and get to heaven. You have to ask God to forgive you. You have to confess your sin. But folks, we live in that day by day. We live in the fact that as far as the east is from the west, our relationship to God is not based in past sin, but it's based in our daily relationship.